Hello and welcome to the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast. I'm Ralph Russo, the college football writer with the Associated Press. The national championship is set. It's Alabama versus Ohio State in the final game of a really long and strange football season. Getting to this point has not been easy, but there is a chance for a really exciting college football playoff title game. To preview Crimson Tide Buckeyes and review this season, I'll be joined this week by the great Chris Fowler of ESPN. Chris will be on the call of Bama, Ohio State. He will also be hosting a virtual Heisman Trophy ceremony on Tuesday night. We are recording this on Monday morning, so you may have already watched that virtual Heisman ceremony on Tuesday night by the time you listen to this, but we wanted to give you a little idea of how ESPN and how Chris, who's going to be the host, was going to try to recreate an experience that is usually face-to-face and very intimate over Zoom calls and in a studio in Bristol. I'll also get his thoughts on the surprising and swift coaching change at Texas. Thanks for listening to the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast. You can find us on Westwood One Podcast, Apple Podcast, just about anywhere you like to get your podcast. If you like what you hear, give us a good review and a good rating. It helps college football fans find us, and it helps us find more college football fans. And away we go. Joining me today, Chris Fowler from ESPN, the great Chris Fowler. Chris, thanks so much for taking a little time and what I know will be a busy week. That's great to talk to you. we got a lot to talk about, uh, about what has already happened and what's uh, yet to come. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's been an interesting and taxing season, a season that has been unlike any other. We have great jobs and we very much appreciate our jobs and we very much appreciate that there was a season to cover in many ways, but it was a season like no other. And I don't think it was as enjoyable as many as a normal college football season would be. When you traveled around the country uh, watching these games and connecting with these players and coaches, or if you even could connect with players and coaches, what was this season like for you? You know, to be to be frank, a lot of the fun, the thrill of the job, the joy of the job is uh, you know leaks away because of what you put up with. But in the end, I mean, we're still calling college football games for a living. So I, I don't I don't lose sight of that and, and everybody in the sport to be able to see how they've adapted and adjusted and been flexible and creative to just to get teams ready to play and to achieve the level of performance they did was inspiring, too. And, and the I'll never forget the season long conversations having with players and coaches about you know, sort of what they've been through, either as young people or middle aged people and that that will stay with me, sort of the messages and the experiences that they have relayed to me. Okay, so you opened the door to this, and we I definitely want to talk to you. We are recording this on Monday, so the Heisman is Tuesday night. A lot of people will be listening to this after the Heisman. I want to get into a little bit of the Heisman. Again, that'll be dated, so I don't want to go too deep on that. Definitely want to get into the national championship game, but I also wanted to get into what you just opened the door to. So let's just stay here. And that is the idea that this has been, this has been a a, a weird season. It's been a difficult season for everybody involved. Now, listen, I don't want to make any of us seem like martyrs here. People have had a far tougher times than us over the last year or so. We have great jobs and I have been appreciative of being able to do this job. Um, but as you sort of, I want to get into a little more of what you just said there about how some of the joy has been taken out of this season. I've already glanced ahead to next season schedule, and I tweeted out the other day, I can't wait for next season. I am hopeful it will be more normal, but that normalcy is what I'm sort of hoping for. Um, when you talk about some of the joy being taken out and some of the stress of this season, if you can elaborate a little bit on that, what, how are in some ways has this been? Uh, I don't know. Again, maybe not as joyful as normal. Preparation's different. Obviously, you never see anybody face to face. Like everybody else in the world, we're using Zoom to communicate. Um, I used to love to meet with players of the home team face to face on Friday, kind of get their their energy, their vibe, their attitude for the game, hear about their journey, 
We've done some of that, but it's not the same when it's not face to face. Same thing with the coaches. Um, no practices to watch, so the preparation's different. Obviously, no fans in the stands at many of the games you've done, so you're not getting that energy back. Um, I think the the games have unfolded very similarly. I, I don't think the players have been affected by the lack of a crowd at all. The intensity feels the same. It may not feel that way to a TV viewer because you're used to having screaming crowds, but I, I don't think the games have been affected that much by the empty stadiums. It's just you don't get the energy back from that. So I used to come out, out of the booth, you know, kind of vibrating. You, you know, you, you kind of go back and you need a couple of drinks to wind down because you're <laughs> a part of this huge collective energized experience well now you put the same thing into a broadcast but you get nothing back from a crowd i I found it to be a very different experience travel's different more uncomfortable you feel uneasy and again as you said it very well so many are going through so much and i feel incredibly fortunate on so many fronts but it helps me relate to the players and the coaches who are constantly tested because i have been too and I think when you describe the experience of people who are you know, 18 to 21 years old, you have to try to get people to understand what it's like to always be tested, anticipating a test, awaiting a result, practicing when you might get tapped on the shoulder at any moment, as Chris Olave was before the Big Ten Championship game, and told, guess what? You're out after preparing all week. And the disappointment there, letting your team down, how you feel about that, worrying about, am I going to get these symptoms? Am I going to get really sick? Am I going to have after effects? Just think about that for a second. While you're never going to a college classroom, all of your classwork's done facing a screen. And then just try to, you know, imagine that the unease before the season, are we going to have games every, every week? You know, it's hour to hour, as Belichick said very well about this football season. And so these guys are not filled with a bunch of years of life experience and wisdom. They're just young college football players and they're tough-minded people and they're led by smart people. But I I became very appreciative as I talked to players about that, Ralph, and the isolation they feel. And they haven't seen their parents, a lot of these guys, all season. So Mm -hmm. the parents might be at a game. If they're lucky, you could wave at them. You can't hug them. You can't really see your family in person. You're isolated from your friends. If your friends aren't on the football team, it's wise to stay away from them because they're not probably maintaining the same protocols as the players. All those things adding up and, and feeling it, you know, we're deep in the postseason. There's just like the finish line. They're just trying to get to the finish line. Two more games, one more game, 10 more days, three more days. I mean, that's how they're thinking. So you're trying to play your best with everything on the line and to not acknowledge that. When you say things like what I just said, that whole monologue, people go, oh, yeah, right. Free education, football for a living must be nice. I understand the mentality. I'm not comparing their situation to frontline workers or people who are, who are unemployed. I, I, you have to understand the distinction. I'm just saying it's very different than any other year in the history of the sport. And to not acknowledge that is to miss the point and not fully un- understand the challenge they've faced. So uh, I want to ask you one. This is this could be a very broad answer. So I don't and I don't want to take up all the time on this, but I'm curious. Did you at all struggle with whether they should be playing a season? Uh, I did, but I also did not feel it was my job to express that opinion because my my job is to figure out if they're going to play and why and how. Um, but clearly, in, internally, I had my own opinions on whether they should or should not play. I'm wondering at, at any, you know, maybe not as the season went on, it became your job to cover the season. But when we went through that period of time where will they or won't they, did you feel, were you saying will they or won't they? Did you feel like, you know, should they or shouldn't they? I guess I, I, I should say. Yeah, I, I don't really frame it as should they or shouldn't they, but I definitely was was skeptical about the prudence of starting on time throughout the period of the spring and early summer. I mean, I'm, I've been dealing with this since since March. I've had phone calls with head coaches who I consider to be the sharpest, the best planners since March and April consistently. So hearing what they had to say, but they didn't think it was likely. The administrators I spoke to, the commissioners, they didn't think it was likely. Right. That's what I was basing it upon. Mm-hmm. If, if they didn't think it was prudent, then 
and that's their world, then I, I was certainly willing to listen to that. And then when you you hear that certain conferences are full speed ahead, while others are very reluctant, you know, you don't know what, who's going to fall on the right side of history there, right? I mean, it turns out that the SEC really conducted things pretty well. The ACC didn't lose that many games and, and didn't have a, a whole slew of positive tests for the most part. You had teams and, and conferences make it through with almost nothing. BC, Northwestern, I mean, congratulations. You know what it took to do that? Do you know what it collectively took to make those decisions to eventually play games look good? But yeah, I was skeptical. And, and you know, it, it's just college football. It, it, let's be honest. It's not the most important thing in the world. And if you're going to put tens of thousands of people in danger every weekend by playing a game, not to mention the players who are being asked to do things that the regular students, their schools were not sure I had mixed feelings about it. Um, you know, I, I think I visited lots of places and I'm not going to get political about this, but I visited lots of different places with different attitudes throughout the season. And there were, there were places I went where COVID wasn't even a thing. Like it wasn't even treated as real. And I thought, how is this football team going to stay on the field given this climate without a bunch of positive tests? Mm -hmm. And the answer was, it was really challenging and so for a lot of teams. And the only way to do it was to stay isolated and ask the players to make the sacrifices I just talked about. Okay, let's get into the Heisman again a little bit. This is Monday morning. We're talking about this. The Heisman will be handed out Tuesday night. It will be a virtual ceremony. And again, because a lot of people will be listening to this after the Heisman possibly has been handed out. I don't want to get too deep into it, but I am curious of how you, how ESPN, how you will try to recreate virtually with you in a studio in Bristol, a broadcast that is really good because of its intimacy, right? I, I think the, you know, listen, I think people sometimes will, hey, just tell me who the winner is. And they don't necessarily want to go through all the features. But, you know, the Heisman has the Heisman broadcast, I think, generally speaking, the best part of it is there's a certain intimacy with these players that comes across. So how if any way, can you recreate that from a studio in Bristol? You can't. I think you don't try to recreate it. I think you try to adapt to the, the resources that we have at our disposal. If there are, are things that are actually positives, advantages, you can use that. Um, I think we, we expect to have a really good roster of former winners joining virtually because they don't have to travel in. Um, but, but no, you, you cannot recreate the intimacy because that, you're exactly right, is a big part of the show. Four guys or five, whatever the case may be that given year, seated very close to each other, um, very nervous, regardless of what they say. The coolest customers in the history of the sport who are very chilled on the field are not chilled when they're in that room. And it's the final hour. And one after another over the years, this would be year, year 27 for me doing the show. And I've heard the same thing from almost all of them, how nervous they are. Whether you can recreate that tension on their part, I don't know. I and mean, I've talked to uh, Smith and Jones would be right off the practice field, right into the chair in front of our cameras for a Heisman show because Nick Saban's not going <laughs> to change practice time because he doesn't <laughs> do that. So I, I said, you know, like to both Mac Jones and Devontae Smith, you're going to be practicing. It's going to take a lot of focus to think that you're going to have a life moment potentially. I mean, being a finalist is a life moment, right? But having your name called is a life changing moment for every winner doesn't matter whether they're in the room or looking at a TV. It was just the same when Andre Ware and Ty Detmer and Barry Sanders, all of them were not in the room when their name was called. Didn't diminish the Heisman experience for them at all. Made it different. But imagine coming off the practice field for the ultimate game in the sport with the <laughs> ultimate focused coach. <laughs> you got to sit in a chair. I don't even, they may not even have a suit on. I don't know if they have time. So, for two of them, that experience is going to be incredibly unique. And then you got the other two guys with Trevor Lawrence and Kyle Trask who are going to be dealing with deep disappointments, not, not playing the way they wanted to in their final game. And that, that's what's so different about this is that, you, you know, the postseason has basically unfolded except for the championship game before the announcement is made. And that is completely different. Usually, boom, the finalists are there. All of them are going to go play in a bowl game. Very often it's a playoff game. So their hopes and dreams are alive in that mm -hmm, respect. Mm -hmm. That's very different this year. So you don't write, you don't try to recreate it. Um, you, you just try to make, make the best of what it is. And I think it's going to be still an interesting, compelling show, but it won't feel the same. You know, for me, 
by the way. Yeah. Uh, listen, there are things I would love to change about the Heisman, the voting structure. I, I, I get some of the complaints. You really want to change it till after the season? No, no, no. I definitely would not want to change it till after the season. I okay. would like to I see. That's where you were going for this. No, yeah. I would like to see a ballot larger, uh, 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 five, top five as a top, as opposed to top three and have it always be a five person finalist because I feel like it celebrates the sport a little more. You guys have time. Maybe make it 90 minutes instead of an hour. Um, oh, I hate that idea. <laughs> we're going to make you work more, Chris. If, if my- <laughs> Oh, Ralph. Veto, veto, veto. <laughs> but, but I will say this. Uh, as much as I may pick at the Heisman for certain things, um, I will always say this. It, it is it is I still find the value of it in two ways. A, it's one of the few consistents in a sport that over decades and decades has changed a lot. And 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 B, when you see the the emotional moments that these young men and their families go through, you appreciate what it means to them. You really do. I mean, I, I've got, and I'm 50 now, so these guys are closer to my 14 year old daughter's age than they are to me. So maybe it's a paternal thing. Like I appreciate that part of the Joe Burrow speech or any of their speeches when they cry a little bit and you see their parents are so elated. Like I'm even getting a little choked up now thinking about it. Like I just love, I, that's the reason why, I, again, I understand there are certain things I'd like to change about the award, but I still very much appreciate the award for the for the emotional side of it for the human side of it that comes out and the speech will be hard to duplicate you can't very you can't difficult have yeah where burrow gets up and stares of course george Ryan and breaks down and his family is there and it begins to be a little bit real although it's certainly surreal to climb that stage lift the trophy look at all those legends behind you and then go over and, and deliver a speech and you know, Burroughs speech joins the great ones that have ever been delivered. I think it's going to be harder for a guy to stare into a camera and deliver it. I don't have the same expectations of sure. emotion, but you never know. I mean, it, it never quite seems real to these guys. And I always do the interview for sports center right after the ceremony. And I sit right next to them. They've had a minute to catch their breath, but it's still, they are spinning. Mm-hmm. But now, how do you expect a guy sitting at his team complex or with his family? How is it going to seem real when the name is called and it's just one more thing happening on a screen, which has been the entire year for everybody, right? I think it's going to be interesting to see how what what sort of emotions and what sort of reactions you do get from that. Okay, let's get into this championship game. You called Ohio State Clemson. Uh, you know, I, I listen. It was definitely. I thought that would be a, a closer game. I thought Clemson would win. Um, I was not necessarily shocked to see how well Ohio State played because Ohio State's really good and they're super talented. So the fact that it all came together for them on one night wasn't particularly shocking. Alabama did what we expected Alabama to do with Notre Dame, and now we have maybe the two most talented rosters in all of college football if you go by the recruiting ranking. And, you know, you can nitpick at them, but there's a lot of five and four stars on these two rosters. So nobody should be surprised about Alabama and Ohio State playing for a national championship. There is, I think, the conventional wisdom is that Alabama has been a cut above everybody else uh, over this season. The stats bear that out. Uh, What are you expecting when you, you know, call the game Monday night with Kirk? You know, I I don't think I was shocked, but I was certainly surprised the way Ohio State played and dominated Clemson because I we hadn't really seen Clemson handled like that, except except by LSU, which I think people rank as one of the greatest teams of all time. Nothing Ohio State had put on the field in the first six games made me think they were one of the great teams. You know, Ryan Day had kept kept saying that the herky jerky season was Mm -hmm. not an advantage. I agree with that, by the way. Yeah. Fresh legs, he said, it would, would not be the factor. The factor was they didn't have any consistency. They hadn't been able to practice consistently. I was surprised that a team that had not put together anything close to a complete game in, in three phases for four quarters, not even close, did that to Clemson. So all credit to their preparation and the the way that those those guys have a championship pedigree. They rose to the moment, and they dominated Clemson on many fronts. Now, you beat one of the ultimate franchises that – the dueling dynasties and now you got to go beat the other one so someone asked me in a call is there a letdown no no letdown you you can't have a letdown when you're playing for the championship it's just really hard to duplicate a supreme performance like that whether you're justin fields whether you're the offensive line the defensive secondary 
yeah, Lawrence had 400 yards. A lot of them were empty yards. They played better than we thought they would, than they had a right to. But now they got to go play the ultimate offense. You talk about, you know, three guys in the top five of the Heisman voting. No offense has ever had that. I thought LSU was the best I'd ever seen in the sport. You can make a case that Alabama is in that same conversation, right? Yes, yeah, statistically the way they, they are. Do it, the way they do it specifically creates some serious matchup problems for Ohio State, okay? I mean, you know, Sean Wade may have led the team in tackles, but he was mistreated a few times by mm-hmm. Clemson back there. And I think that when Devontae Smith and others look at the tape, they're going to see lots of plays to be made. And Sarkeesian is his closing statement in Alabama calling plays. Um, man, you know, as good as Ryan Day was calling offensive plays and completely outdueling Venables head to head in that matchup, you know, Sarkeesian is, is brilliant at that. And Ohio State staff will have their hands full. Because, uh, you know, they had already pulled plenty of tape. Like oh, Alabama doesn't wait to see who's going to win the semifinal. They had all of Ohio State stuff already prepared. You know, the, the many analysts that work behind the scenes and boom, hit the ground running. They'll, they'll look for ways to exploit. But, you know, Ohio State, if they can play with the same raw aggression, the same physical power that, that harassed and hit. And, and knocked the ball out of Lawrence's hands three times and picked them off and made him feel uncomfortable. If they can do that to Mac Jones, who's not doesn't have the same escapability, no, they got a chance. But it, Jones has been so hard to affect in the pocket. I mean, he's just really, really good with a clean pocket. The analytics are off the charts, and he's and he's kept clean so often because of that great running game. You can't just sell out and rush the passer. You got Harris there is had a Heisman worthy season himself. So, I mean, that's why it's the highest over under going into any championship game, Ralph. And people expect a whole lot of points and can Ohio state score with them. I think people doubted they could do it against Clemson and they, they proved people wrong, you know, (laughs) seven touchdowns later. Yeah. They could score with Clemson and leave them in the dust, but they got to do it again against an even better team. Yeah, I, I will be, certainly be very interested to see if, if Justin Fields can come close to his performance. Now, again, Justin has been a tremendous player over his time at Ohio State. Um, you know, so one of your ESPN colleagues, uh, said this to me before the, the championship game. I talked to Greg McElroy about Justin Fields and Ohio State. He was talking about Fields in particular, but sort of Ohio State in general. And he said, you know, I feel like Ohio State has all year been playing like they're trying to win all the games in one game. In other words, they have a very little, a small sample size. They're, they're losing games and they're putting a lot of pressure on themselves to sort of be the best of themselves in every single game in a way that might not be realistic. And I think, you know, they might come out in the playoff and they're finally there and just rip it and feel a little loose. And frankly, I think Greg may have been onto something because that's what it looked like. So I'm wondering if, if you sense any of that from Ohio State, that there was maybe a little bit of a weight lifted, just getting to the playoff allowed them to find their ceiling, allowed them to, you know, get some of that pressure of, hey, how many games you're going to play? Are you going to play enough? And just play ball. Yeah, there's a lot to that. I I would, I agree with much of that. I, I would not say loose. I would say they played with a lot of freedom, a lot of abandon and a lot of anger. I mean, the no respect thing was real. Uh, you know, Dabo's comments, they didn't talk publicly about uh, that too much. The coaches didn't, but I, it was deeply, deeply personal. And you put on top of the game last season that they think they should have won and mm-hmm. the officials got in the way. And mm-hmm. Ohio State had no shortage of fuel. Now, you know, they also have a ton of talent. I, I think Justin is an interesting situation because I think he, he mentally was all over the place all year. And when you try to be perfect and you're supposed to win the Heisman after three games and you're, they're talking about maybe you're the number one prospect, not Lawrence, or if not that, you're number two. I mean, he, he's only played a year and a half of football, right? Right. right. So he, has, he didn't have he had like a third of the amount of experience playing college football than Lawrence did going into the matchup. So I wondered how he would handle it. We talked to him in the week of the game. He seemed to mentally be really in a good place, very determined. But we saw, I think, things from him. That, that not only he hadn't shown, but very few in the history of the sport had shown that kind of toughness. I thought, I thought his ribs were broken. I thought yeah, he's, he's either me got too. broken ribs or an injured kidney mm-hmm. when Skalski put the helmet in him. And he comes back after missing one play. I mean, I'm going to remember that forever. So I think physically he responded, but mentally he was in a much better place. They just let it rip. They played with anger. They played with freedom. 
and and they they found their best performance and they're going to have to do it again. Uh, I don't necessarily this is maybe sounds a little hyperbolic, but the idea that Alabama could have maybe its best team or or just yet another great Alabama team that never had an issue. Well, I shouldn't say never had an issue with COVID because Nick Saban missed the game, but nonetheless, there was no outbreaks on the Alabama team that forced it to miss games. I guess what I'm trying to say is the idea that this seemingly impenetrable dynasty would be the team that gets through at the end, not just having survived the season, but having maybe put forth the greatest team of the dynasty through the season seems do you, do you think you could say that? I, I think people who who watch Alabama would say, "Well, well, wait a minute." Not not in terms of being a complete team. There's oh, no way this defense but ranks a, anywhere close to their best. But defense. it's also a very different style of football they're playing. So yeah, no, I get, I completely no, get because that. Saban has been smart enough to realize yeah. over the years the defense doesn't win championships. Offense but, does, but it and, is and the kind of offense that they have now. Deep shots, aggressive, mm-hmm. wide open passing game to complement the running game. I, I think his transformation has been very smart. I think it's Bama's best offense ever, clearly. And I think what you said is is very true. Although Nick missed a game, and as did Ryan Day, his organization handled it brilliantly, got through it. And I think what you see at the end of this season of turmoil is the the the, the top organizations and franchises are the ones that were standing at the end. And it's not an accident. And Alabama stands at the top of the class in that department. Very quickly, uh, you mentioned Sark going to Texas. Uh, I, you know, I think we were all caught off guard a little bit by Texas, you know, after saying a couple of weeks ago that it was going to stick with Tom Herman, knowing that that seemed like an awkward thing to do because they seemingly had already pulled the rug out from under him. And then they spin around fire Tom Herman and a few hours later hire Steve Sarkeesian. Clearly that had been in the works. Um, let me just get your opinion on sort of the redemption story of Sark. Because I think at a very human level, again, at a very human level, it's hard not to feel good for Sark getting this opportunity because of where his life was after the USC uh, situation fell apart. Agreed. I like Sark. Known him a long time. Um, covered his teams at Washington and obviously USC and then as an assistant. So I feel good for him. He he needs to fully appreciate the challenge of the job he's walking into, which I think is one of the hardest in America. You're right, though. He He's he's had kind of a couple uh, redemptions with, with Saban because the Falcons experience didn't work out very well. But that's what Nick does. Takes really talented, good people, gives them a chance because he's got the equity to hire whoever he wants. Even though Steve, you know, came with some baggage certainly the first time, but I, I'm just happy for him personally that he's working out the things in his life because the challenges away from the field that he faces are real, and and uh, they're they're lifelong challenges. So I, I appreciate that he's got himself sorted out. I think he'll do uh, he'll do his thing at Texas, and I it, it's easy to be snarky and say, well, he's going to get fired. It's just a matter of when, right? I mean, that's what people are saying because Texas does that; they fire coaches. As, as most top programs do, you know, but but I think he, he's got a great chance to succeed. I mean, Texas is still such, quote unquote, untapped potential, not having really been in championship position, um, you know, since Mac Brown had Vince Young and those those great teams. But but, you know, he's got he's got a lot of work to do. Um, he's got the culture to sort of carefully mind and I, I think he's a smart adaptable guy but um you know it, it's it's very challenging in texas as you know and and, and as the results bear out because tom herman's not a stupid guy or a bad coach he'll land somewhere and do very well i suspect but uh you know in the end in the end couldn't get it done there and we'll see if sark can yeah uh it's a. Uh- it, it's always Texas, no matter what, and even when they're not on this on the big stage, they always manage to force their way into it the conversation. It requires so much of that job. The reason why it's such a tough job is because Mac Brown was the master. You had to be a politician. The, yes. the, the, this Texas football, it, it's, a, it's a political climate. It, it's, there's politicians everywhere. Everyone thinks they're stakeholders in the program. They're all like Jerry Jones Jr. And they, <laughs> they, they want to have a stake in everything that goes on in the football program because they got a ton of money. And, and that's just real. You can talk to Mac about it. I'm sure you have. You have to navigate that. Mm-hmm. You have to navigate that brilliantly. Then you have to, to figure out how to, to politically align yourself with enough of the high school coaches and the gatekeepers to the talent in Texas. I mean, Sark has all the ingredients, but you know, Tom Herman arrived with all the ingredients too. 
Chris Fowler, the great Chris Fowler for ESPN, he will be on the call for the national championship game on January 11th between Alabama and Ohio State. Kirk will be in the booth. He will be in the booth. Okay. Will, yes. Okay. That's the plan. That, that, that's the expectation. The, the 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 existing protocol will not keep him out. Let's just, I, you got eight hey, minutes, hour to hour. I hope I'm in the booth, brother. I mean, seriously. You, so, you, you, you I, know? no, I hear you. I hear you. We're, we are all. We everything is tentative. We are all day to day. I will hear. The, so I didn't. He. I, I only saw a little bit of a recording of the broadcast because I was actually at the game. But I heard f- through Twitter and through people who did watch on TV that that went across pretty seamlessly that there was not a big there there was for the listener the idea that Kirk wasn't there wasn't necessarily something that could stand out so good for you good for Kirk good for everybody involved because yeah. I know that's not necessarily an easy thing no very difficult we've done it once in the regular season um when he was at right. home but that was not a championship level type game and so the technical side was brilliant he had all the toys and tools he needed they did a phenomenal job getting his home office set up you know, Kirk's the best in the business, handled it beautifully. And this, by the way, Ralph, is this our 25th season together. So <laughs> I, I think the chemistry and we're, we're sort of um, very intuitively connected that way. If you go back to you know game day since 96 and the Thursday booth and then the Saturday night booth since 14, I mean, we're, we've done a lot of work together. And he, I could see him, he could see me. And uh, we... I think that it would have been more challenging, as you've heard all season long, for booths that haven't spent a lot of time together to do that. I consider it a high compliment that people didn't know or realize or were not constantly reminded we were in different places. It was not a perfect broadcast. We want to very much be in the same booth in Miami to, to make it feel normal. But uh, I was happy that uh, happy that we more or less pulled it off. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Chris, thank you so much for doing this. Good luck with everything going forward. Good luck with your next test and your travels. And uh, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, my friend. I don't know if we'll see you in Miami or not, but (laughs) stay well and yeah, stay healthy and, and happy new year, everybody. And now, instead of three and out, something a little different. It has been a long and arduous season, a roller coaster. It's been fun at times, at least on Saturdays, to cover this sport. It has been a grind many other times, and we didn't even know if we were going to have a season. I am appreciative that we did, especially to the players who sacrificed a lot to make it happen. But I'm also, or at least I was, kind of torn on whether there should be a season. Now, I didn't really feel like it was my responsibility to share my opinion on whether there would be a season. Frankly, I didn't think I was necessarily the most informed person to decide whether there should be a season. And I say that meaning that I was talking to a lot of people trying to figure out if they would play and how they would play if they if they did play. But I realized very quickly that it was going to be a tough call and I wouldn't necessarily have every little bit of information as much as I tried to gather it to help do my job, which is report the news of whether there would be a season or not. But nonetheless, of course, I had an opinion. And of course, my mind changed from day to day at times, whether they should or shouldn't play. I found myself thinking whether it would be worth it to play. In other words, if the season would be such a hodgepodge of disruptions and canceled games, of teams maybe bailing out midway through the season, if that was even worthwhile to put forth a season that lacked any kind of competitive integrity or was ended up being so few games or so little continuity as to make it not really worth the effort that it was being put into, that it wasn't necessarily worth the sacrifice that everybody would have had to make to try to put on a season if by the time November rolled around, it would be in tatters. So I really struggled with that to a certain degree. But again, I didn't feel the need to necessarily declare what my opinion was on that because I didn't know if I really had a strong opinion either way. I just understood it was going to be a very, very tough call. When it came into August, I found myself struggling with this, and I wanted to share it with you because I thought maybe you would find it interesting, and we've sort of been through this ride together, so I felt like I should sort of reveal what I was going through as I was trying to report it out, which essentially was my job but also internally struggling with whether they should or should not play. 
And I got to the point where I kind of realized, and I think this is the reason why we did have a season, is because it became apparent that the players, the most important people in this process, were young and healthy enough that the worst case scenario consequences of contracting the virus were not going to be what they faced, or at least in a very, very, very rare occasion. Mostly the players would be fine. That's not to say that we should just have blown off the idea that they got that many players contracted the virus. That was not good. That was not the goal. The goal was to keep players from contracting the virus. That was the stated goal to try to keep the virus away from the athletes. But some solace could be taken if you are going to try this endeavor that there could be cases and mostly the players would not be at the most harshly affected, that most of them would bounce back pretty easily. We won't know the long-term consequences of this virus and how this thing worked out in the long run. And in five to 10 years, a very different story could be written about how we had a season in a pandemic and how we went about this pandemic in many ways, but from a college football standpoint, how playing may not have been the best idea. That History is still not to be written, but I felt like at a certain point there was enough science there to say the players will end up being mostly, for the most part, okay contracting the virus. They will get over it and they will be able to return to play. So that was very important. And the other part of it, that thing that was very important was this idea that the virus wasn't being transmitted on the field. Playing football, practicing football was not going to be a super spreader. So I think that gave a lot of people who were making this decision, those two elements, hope that, you know what, we're not going to be dealing with the most dire consequences and our activity itself is not a super spreader. So we should, we might be able to get through this. If we have a lot of diligence and a lot of planning. So let's see if we can do that. And I found myself thinking, yeah, that, that makes sense too. And maybe we should just try to plow ahead or we, they should just try to plow ahead. And then the, the determination of whether we have a season will be made by how much disruption we will have. I've said this a lot throughout the last six to eight months that ultimately Tolerance for disruption would decide how much season we would have. If we got through a month and hardly any games were played, so many were being canceled that we ended up having to stop, then that would be, that would have, the virus will have determined what kind of season we will have or we would have had. If the disruptions were manageable and enough games could be played, they would push forward and play as many games as possible. And that's essentially what ended up happening in most of the games over 80, I think 87% of the games that were scheduled ended up being played. So was that a successful season? I think so on paper. But again, I also think that history will still be the judge of that as far as whether too many people were exposed to this virus through college football, through the sort of forcing of playing a college football season. Ultimately, I was in a place where I thought, yes, I think that they should go ahead and we'll see what happens from there. And the players and the coaches and the ADs and the university presidents and the fans to a certain degree will decide, hey, this is too ragged for me. We got to shut this down or we're going okay. There's some bumps in the road, but we can get through this. And the players really wanted to do that. And I think that was important that the players, for the most part, very much wanted to play as long as it was safe. And again, if you don't think playing college football is going to be a detriment, not most, not just to the players, but also to controlling the pandemic at large, then Why not play? And that was where I think for me, I had some second thoughts. The idea of we're not really handling this pandemic particularly well. Is playing college football another sign, another signal, another thing that we are just saying, oh, no, we must do this. So much about controlling the pandemic was about asking people to sacrifice some a lot more than others. You know, many of us had to sacrifice by simply staying at home or not going to work or our kids staying at home. And that stinks. And uh, and 
that's certainly not nothing. But there are also a lot of us who had to sacrifice a whole lot more than that. So from my perspective, on the sacrifice scale, me personally, I'm pretty low there, right? My life was okay, relatively speaking, throughout this whole ordeal, though I certainly will hope that it gets better as we come out of the pandemic. Um, but nonetheless, sacrifices needed to be made to control the pandemic. And we started having fights over what is essential, what can we not live without? And I found myself thinking like college football, just as, as Chris Fowler mentioned in our interview with him, was not necessarily an essential thing. And at a certain point, we needed leaders to step up and sort of say, no, this is not essential. We are going to ask for some sacrifices along the way to control the pandemic for the greater good, right? Because ultimately what we want to try to do is get this thing under control, have less people start stop dying, get it under control quickly enough so it doesn't linger so long so that we're just fighting it for months and months and months. So I, I found myself almost thinking like in a symbolic way, maybe college football shouldn't go forward because we are simply, again, asking folks to sacrifice. Of course, that was asking more of college football than we were asking of many other things in life. So I don't know. So where I ended up coming down and where I ended up feeling like, you know what? We should have a college football season because at a certain point, I thought to myself, why should college football be held to a different standard than a lot of other things in this country? Why should the leaders of college football be held to a higher standard than the leaders of of many other things in this country. We weren't getting great leadership throughout the pandemic as far as sort of asking people to sacrifice and then helping the people who sacrifice the most. Like we will ask you to sacrifice, but we are going to make an effort to help the people who are sacrificing the most get through this thing. And in lieu of that, I felt like shutting down the college football season would have been Again, asking more and holding college football and its leaders, holding Greg Sankey, for example, or Bob Bowlesby to a higher standard than we held many of our other leaders in this country who weren't really getting across that message of sacrifice. So, again, I was a little torn, but I found myself thinking, yes, we should play college football. The kids want it. They will mostly be okay coming through this, at least I think and hope. Uh, I think that allowing this activity to occur provided a little sense of normalcy and hopefully some joy to folks on Saturdays and Thursday, Thursday evenings, but mostly on Saturdays. The idea that we were kind of grinding through Monday through Friday, uh, covering this sport and all the things that were going wrong, but at least when we got to Saturday, we felt like there was some normalcy. Uh, at least for a few hours, it felt like just playing college football. And even the, on Saturdays, sometimes it was hard to look at what was going on and think of it as normal when games would get canceled hours before and players who were really important players wouldn't play in big games like Trevor Lawrence. Or we would just see teams and think, wow, how are they even getting getting through this with X amount of players missing? Uh, so it was anything but normal and it was never as enjoyable as a college football season that it should be. But ultimately, I found myself thinking, yes, it should be played. Again, because I felt like to not play college football would be to hold it to a higher standard than we did many other things in this country. I don't think we necessarily handled the pandemic particularly well. I don't necessarily think playing college football in and of itself made the pandemic worse. I do think symbolically we signed off on a lot of normal activities that probably gave the impression that, hey, everybody just go about your business and that's the best way to get through this when that was probably not the best way to get through this. But I'm still thankful that we played this season. I'm thankful for all the players and the coaches and the administrators who worked so hard to try to get through the season. Um, I'm never completely bought into the idea that the players were safer playing than they were not. 
I think anecdotally, there's a good argument to be made there. I'd like to see some data to support that. And when I see teams with dozens and dozens of players who got infected, it makes me sort of doubt that at least a little. But I'm not dismissing that argument. And I do think when you see some of the numbers and the positivity rates at some schools, you can make a good argument that, hey, these players were probably better off in this system of very strict protocols as opposed to out on their own when the virus was running wild in the general community. Thanks for listening to my monologue. That's the show for today. I'd like to thank my producer, Sarah McCrory, for making me sound good. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts and Westwood One Podcasts. Please subscribe so you do not miss an episode. I'm Ralph Russo, the college football writer with the Associated Press. Thanks for listening and come back for more next week. We will have one more after the championship game. The day after, we'll wrap it all up on the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast. <laughs>